Excuse me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Ian Lesser from GMF here in Brussels. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we start and before th I turn this over to David Ignatius, uh, I just uh, wanted to say a word on behalf of GMF uh, of uh, condolence and sympathy for all who were touched by these tragic events this weekend. I'm sure you will all join me in that. Um, the second thing I would like to say is how grateful we are to David Ignatius for uh, coming over to moderate this discussion, uh, to for really suggesting this and for bringing it together. Uh, David is a board member of GMF, uh, and as you'll, many of you know him from Brussels Forum and many other things, uh, but we're extremely grateful uh, to him as well as to uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Turkey bin Faisal al Saud and also Genus General Amos Yadlin. Uh, for being with us today. Uh, David will do a uh, more formal introduction. Uh, but I did also, before we begin, want to underscore something which is very important to us at GMF, which is the transatlantic dimension of what we're going to be talking about uh, today. These issues obviously important for the region and the future of its people and societies, but also very, very important to Europe and the United States. And for us at GMF, this gives it a special significance. Uh, a couple of very brief housekeeping points before we start. Um, first of all, this event will be live streamed uh, on our website, gmfus.org. Uh, and it will also be tweeted live. Uh, uh, the event will be tweeting uh, the event live from at gmfus using the hashtag gmfme. So thank you all very much again for joining us. Uh, and David, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. It's a great pleasure to be here with two courageous men that I admire. I want to introduce them a little bit more fully, and then I want to explain to you how it is that we all came to be here. Uh, first, uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal bin Saud is the former head of Saudi intelligence, served as Saudi ambassador in Washington uh, until 2007 and is now chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in the Kingdom. Amos Yadlin is a career fi fighter pilot, served in the Israeli uh, Air Force for more than 30 years, uh, was head of Israeli military intelligence, uh, was Israeli military attache in Washington, D.C. before that, and is now chairman of what uh, is widely regarded as the top national security think tank in Israel called the Institute for National Security Studies. So how did we end up here on this stage? If you'll forgive me, I'm going to just briefly explain how it came to be. Uh, four months ago uh, in Munich at the Munich Security Conference, uh, sitting in the front row of a discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which had Martin Indyk, Saeb Erekat, Zippy Livni, the Israeli negotiator, was Prince Turkey. And uh, when it came time for questions and answers, Prince Turkey turned to Zippy Livni, the Israeli representative in particular, and said, why don't the Israelis respond to and accept the Saudi peace initiative that's been enunciated by King Abdullah. We'd like to get an answer. So there was a discussion back and forth. And anyway, I wouldn't say there was a very direct answer to your question, Prince Turkey. So when that session ended, Amos Yadlin, who was sitting nearby, turned to me and said, David, I'd like to answer Prince Turkey's question. So the next night, I, I, I found Prince Turkey at a dinner, and I said, Your Highness, what do you think of this? Here's a crazy idea for you. Uh, if we could organize a, a session where there could be a discussion between two former heads of intelligence from Saudi Arabia and Israel talking about the future of the region, 
would you be willing to do that? He thought about it, but not very long, and said yes. So I'm happy to say that that brought these two gentlemen here. Uh, I do salute their independence of thought and their courage in being ready to uh, take questions in this uh, open, unrehearsed, on the record setting. And I want to begin by asking each of you, uh, this meeting uh, is poignant because it comes after the collapse of Secretary of State John Kerry's nine-month uh, effort to reach a peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. And I want to ask you, Prince, uh, first uh, you, Prince Turkey, to give us a sense of where we are in your mind after those negotiations have broken down, and second, where we should go next. Thank you very much, David. And uh, let me say that uh, when David asks you something, you can never say no. Um, he's such a persuasive uh, individual and such a good friend, I think, and quite a, a distinguished representative of not a very distinguished uh, profession. Um, <laughs> so uh, really, it, it's, a, it's quite a pleasure uh, to sit down with you. And of course, Gary Alon Adlin is very well known, and uh, I don't need to, to give him any praises because he doesn't expect any from me. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the Arab-Israeli and, if you like, Palestinian-Israeli dispute has been with us for, for some time. And um, uh, Secretary Kerry, when he took on the task of uh, bringing the two sides together for, for agreement, uh, he expressed the difficulties that will be faced in achieving that, that agreement. And I must say, uh, he is to be applauded for his effort. I don't know how many times he visited the area. I don't know how many telephone calls he made, but he sure spent a lot of his energy and his time uh, doing that, and we're to be grateful to him. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't yet uh, reached a conclusion, so uh, the, uh, the dispute is going to continue, um, unless a miracle comes down from the sky. But I don't expect that to happen too soon. Um, there are, in my view, very good reasons to have peace between the Israelis and the Arabs. First, of course, is that there will be no more bloodshed between them. Uh, human lives are important, as was, of course, unfortunately, the experience in, in this city, I think, uh, Saturday. Few, uh, on Saturday has shown that there are those who are willing to, to take lives for whatever purpose they may have. We have living examples of that, of course, in our part of the world, whether it is in Syria or Iraq or in other places. Lives are being taken every day, and people are simply um, going on with their lives while this uh, tragedy is, is, is occurring. Um, so the, the, the kingdoms offer of a peace initiative in 2002, in my view, still remains the most um, viable and the most uh, doable uh, proposal that has come about between Israel and the Arabs since the dispute began uh, several decades ago. And it's on the table. It has never been uh, taken up by Israel. Uh, they've had several governments since it was put on the table. But all those governments have not yet said yes. And hence my question to Zippy Livni at, uh, in, in Munich. Uh, and the uh, general has promised to, to uh, answer my question, and I hope he does. But it is there. And it's for anybody to look at. There is nothing under the table uh, agreement or uh, underhanded or secret clauses to it. It's up front. Um, the Arabs will recognize Israel diplomatically, normalize relations, end hostilities, in return for Israel withdrawing from all the lands that it occupied in 1967. Um, the Arabs went further than that when they met with Mr. Kerry to help him restart the negotiations between Mr. Abbas and Mr. Netanyahu and said that they'd be willing to accept 
land swaps along the border of 1967. So this is where it stands. And, and yet and if there is no response from the Israeli government on that specific uh, proposal. And I think if we want to go ahead after Mr. Kerry's efforts, it should be on those terms. Um, we've tried everything else. It hasn't succeeded. So let me turn to General Yadlin. And um, four months ago, you said you wanted to answer that question. And let me ask you to begin with that and then speak more generally <coughs> to the situation in which Israel and the Palestinians find themselves. Thank, thank you, David, for arranging this meeting. And thank you, His Highness, uh, Prince Turkey, for uh, coming here to share uh, this important meeting with us. I cannot agree more than peace is important. It's important for everybody in the Middle East. It's important for the Palestinians. It's important for the uh, Syrians, for the uh, Saudis. And we all uh, looking to achieve this goal. Uh, we already have peace with two Arab countries, uh, Egypt and Jordan. Uh, we do uh, see as a very positive the fact that the, all the upheavals in the Arab world uh, have not uh, directed the leaders of these countries to abolish the peace uh, accords with Israel. And we do call on the other Arab countries to go in the same uh, route. Uh, because with all due respect to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and we all want to solve this problem, we do see in the Arab world, in the Middle East, much bigger problems. And what we see in the last three years in the Arab world has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian issue. The poverty, the millions of young people who are well educated and go out to the labor market and cannot find jobs. The civil war, the sectarian conflict, <coughs> the killing that going on in Syria as we speak, the terrorism that go on in Iraq as we speak has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian issue. We'll, However, we'll, we get, want, we'll get to those. We uh, want to solve this issue. And I also uh, join my colleague in uh, very much appreciation to the efforts done by Secretary Kerry in the last nine months. And <coughs> the problem is that my assessment of the process have been from the very beginning that the chances of him to succeed is very low. Sometimes people ask me what is the chances of Kerry to succeed to reach a comprehensive peace. My answer was, it's like if you, David, uh, the chances that you will win the lottery if you haven't bought a ticket. So where we are going from here? We must go for here in a different paradigm. The paradigm of reaching a full comprehensive agreement is very difficult and unachievable as long as the two leaders in both countries cannot lead their people to do the necessary concessions needed. And there are three very difficult uh, concessions that each side should do. On the Israeli side, it's the two-state solution recognition instead of you know the bigger Israel. It's based on 67 border with swaps and partition of Jerusalem. Three very, very tough concessions that go against the history of our people, the beliefs of our people, the uh, political position of the main parties, and our historical narrative. Palestinians has to do three tough concessions. Recognize that this is the end of conflict and finality of claims, that the Palestinian refugees will return only to the Palestinian state and have some limitation on their sovereignty for security. <coughs> I don't see the two leaders doing these concessions, and this is the, basically the tragedy of the peace process. So we have to look for 
a plan B for a different paradigm, which will bring the sides closer, that will make the chances of having another bloodshed lower, and will wait for maybe for a different time. And I am not avoiding the Arab Peace Initiative, because I promise to answer. We have no problem with the Saudi Peace Initiative. It was a very good initiative. The real problem was that the Saudi Peace Initiative became the Arab League <coughs> dictate in 2002 in a summit in Beirut. What the Saudis have published was modified. Was modified to be a take it or leave it kind of offer with parameters that we cannot uh, accept. Mostly in the issue of returning the Golan Heights to the Syrians. And you may think how we would have felt today if what's going on in Syria were uh, in the Golan Heights and the issue of the refugees. I do encourage the Saudis to go back to their original plan and to make it a basis for negotiation on the principles that I just described and I think they are very similar to the Clinton principles and to carry framework that unfortunately Abu Mazen even refused to discuss it with your president on March 16 in his visit in the White House. Let me get an answer from uh, Prince Turkey t to that. Um, Amos Yadlin is saying that the original proposal by King Abdullah um, is something that he, I think you, I heard your words, accepts. Um, as a basis for negotiation. As a basis for negotiation. Um, what about the idea of restarting King Abdullah's initiative um, as a basis for negotiation, um, some elements of which would be subject to discussion, modification, uh, negotiation? What do you think of that? Let me go back with you to 1981-82. At that time, uh, the late King Fahad, after Camp David had split the Arab world, if you remember, with uh, Egypt Sadat signing the peace uh, agreement with, with Israel and the rest of the Arab world shunning uh, Sadat and ex uh, excommunicating Egypt from, from the Arab world. Um, at that time, none of the Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia, would even uh, admit that there is such a thing as a state called Israel. I remember in the papers, and you, those of you who are old enough to do that will always uh, uh, reflect on how Israel was referred to as the alleged state of, of Israel or the pretend state of, of Israel. King Fahad at that time in the Arab League, in an Arab summit meeting in Morocco, made an eight-point proposal to the Arab world that would include the establishment of a Palestinian state, etc., etc. And the last clause in that, in that eight-point uh, uh, proposal was that all states in the area would be recognized and would be safeguarded and guaranteed their security and, and safety. And it was the first time that the Arab world accepted Israel as a state. The first attempt to do that in 1981 failed because at that time, Iraq and, and under Saddam and Syria and their Hafez al-Assad and Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, etc., refused to agree to that. But after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, and I think at that time the the bringing down perhaps of if I remember the, the, the number correctly, 90 Syrian aircraft, and maybe you were operating in that in that battle general yourself. I did. <laughs> um, 
seemed to have convinced at least Assad at that point that something must be done to reach some kind of an end to the hostilities. So all the Arab states accepted the Fahad peace plan. But nothing came from Israel. No response whatsoever. Total disregard for what from Saudi Arabia and the other Arab countries was considered a very important step uh, forward. And unfortunately, that was replicated in, uh, in 2002 when King Abdullah made his proposal. Um, for him to get all the Arab states to agree, as I said, to recognize Israel, to normalize relations with Israel, to end hostilities with Israel, it had to be a proposal that all of them would agree to. And what are the difficulties in that proposal from if the Israelis were willing to talk to us about them, but as the general himself has, has made, the three issues of Jerusalem, the borders, and the refugees. And the Arab peace proposal was very clear on that. There are no shadows or, or gray areas in that area. The issue of, of, of borders, as I said, the Arabs have come to accept land swaps. Jerusalem has to be a two, two, uh, capital for two states, with Arab Jerusalem and, and Israeli Jerusalem. And the refugees, the, what the Arab Peace Initiative says that the settlement of the refugee problem must be done through negotiation, through agreement with the Israelis. And this is not just based on, on whimsical um, uh, demand or, 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 or diktat, uh, as, as the general was saying about the Arabs presenting uh, Israel with, with, uh, with a diktat. No, it was based on, on talks that happened, if you remember, in Taba. In, in, in 2000 and, and uh, early January 2001 between Israel and, and the Palestinians, when the issue of refugees was, was talked about that, there was talk of a settlement there, a negotiated settlement for the refugees, with a certain number of refugees being accepted to go back to, to, uh, to what used to be Palestine and now is, is, uh, is Israel, and the others would be compensated. That was a, one of the discussions that was being held in, in Taba between the Palestinian leadership itself uh, and the Israelis. So I think it is regrettable that these conditions that Israel has put on the Arab Peace Initiative are the stumbling block. Rather than sitting down at the table, taking the Arab Peace Initiative as it is, and negotiating. The Israelis negotiate with the Palestinians. Unfortunately, you can't negotiate with the Syrians now because nobody is there to represent Syria. But and on Lebanon, Israel still occupies land in Shab'a and another place, I forget what its name is. These are negotiable issues. And particularly on the Palestinian issue, I don't see any problem with sitting down and talking about refugees, about <coughs> about Jerusalem, about land swaps, etc., etc., as the general has defined them being the, the, the core issues that prevent uh, an Israeli uh, agreement, if you like, to the wording of the Arab uh, peace initiative. Uh, I, I want to... Please, uh, it sounds like you're getting yes for an answer. I want to... Uh, to look uh, into the future and not into the history. We do uh, respect very much King Fahad Initiative and King, Ab King Abdallah Initiative. Uh, however, the Israeli public uh, is not aware of this initiative because of the timing that it came on board. It came in the midst of a terror attack, many terror attacks that Arafat had launched in 2000, 2001, 2002. And nobody paid attention in the time when terror flooding your streets, your buses, your uh, shopping malls. Uh, and even today, I have a fresh uh, poll of the Israeli uh, population. 74% of them have no idea what is the Arab Peace Initiative. 
My suggestion is that His Highness will come to Jerusalem, will pray in the mosques, which are, uh, for all practical purpose, uh, controlled by uh, Muslim uh, leadership of uh, Jordan and Palestine. And then a very short drive to the Knesset. We'll speak to the Israeli people. I guess, and this is another question from the poll, that if Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu will support the Arab Peace Initiative, then 65% of the Israelis will go with it. So what we have to do is to look into the future, not into the past. And the fact that you give a veto vote for every extreme country in the Arab world, and that's what happened uh, back in 2002. The Syrians put a veto on the important compromise that the, the, Arab, the Saudi peace initiative offered to us. So let's make it, and I think we are on agreement, as a base for negotiation. Bring those who really want peace, and not the radical part of the Arab League, and reach peace. So Prince Turkey, there's a proposal on the table that uh, you pray in, uh, in Jerusalem and then address the Knesset. Would you consider uh, doing something like that? Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the girl knows that. Um, um, I think, now to be serious, um, you have to negotiate with, with, with good heart and with, with genuine commitment to achieving peace, not to use emotions as a means of, of influencing or um, attempting to divert attention from the important issue here. The important issue here that we're talking about is that the Arabs have put forward what the rest of the world agrees is a viable and very genuine and sincere proposal for a comprehensive solution to the Arab-Israeli dispute. To put me as a stumbling block or as a means of a key of opening a door in this, who am I to do that? It is for the Israeli leadership to explain to their people what the Arab Peace Initiative is. They've read it. They're better qualified to go to their people and say, listen, this is a good proposal. Let's take it up. Since the establishment of Israel in 1947, this is what Israelis have always told the rest of the world. If only the Arabs would agree to sit with us and talk about peace, that is all we want. They tried that in, in, in the talks in, in, in uh, in 1949, after the hostilities ended in um, uh, the island of Cyprus. Rhodos. Or Rhodos, sorry. Uh, Rhodos, and uh, in other such uh, areas. Well, the Arabs, the Arabs have crossed the Rubicon. They don't want to fight Israel anymore. Israel has so much military superiority over them. It has atomic weapons. We all know that. It has the means to deliver those weapons. The general built those means in the Air Force and perhaps even the missile delivery systems. The Israeli Navy has submarines that can launch these missiles. So the Arabs are not crazy. What they're doing, instead of waging war, the Arabs are waging peace. And this is what we want to do. Just sit down and talk and you can negotiate on anything. But emotional issues like me going to to Jerusalem to pray before the leaders of Israel explain to the Israeli people what the Arab Peace Initiative is, I think that's putting the chicken before the egg. I'd rather put the egg before the chicken. Um, uh, General Yadlina, a last uh, comment before we turn to other regional issues, and, and perhaps you raised in passing the, the idea of some alternative to this tragically blocked peace process, uh, referred to it as Plan B. Is this a good time for you to, to say in more detail what that might mean? Yeah. S President Sadat has put the, the hand before the chicken. 
we change totally the mood in Israel. So it's not necessarily a bad uh, step. I don't call it emotional step. I, I call, think, I think I call it a Netanyahu step. Netanyahu should make an, a, a similar step. Netanyahu is willing the, to come to accept, Mecca and to and Jeddah accept, tomorrow. Accept the Palestinian, tomorrow. Accept the Palestinian state. That's, how, that's, that's the hand that he should put ahead of the egg. He did, he did uh, the speech in Bar Ilan in 2009 on Palestinians, on two states to two nations. But I think it's an issue of trust, and there is a lot of distrust. And when you see a, a, another, a leader of a very respected kingdom or republic that will come to, to uh, bring uh, the voice of peace to Israel, it may do the breakthrough that we all so much need. Uh, if this is not going to happen, I'm, I'm suggesting not to be uh, stuck in the status quo. I think the status quo is not good for the Israelis, it's not good for the Palestinians, and we have to move forward. If agreement cannot be achieved, because sometimes what I see is the other way around. Instead of you supporting Abu Mazen to do the concessions that he has to do, and he haven't done it. He hasn't done them yet. That you, the Arab world, will support him to more moderate positions on end of conflict, on finality of claims, on the refugee issue, only when he want to have a very extreme position, like his position on the right of the Jewish nation to have a state, he is going to the Arab League to get an approval to a position that will make negotiation impossible. So my expectation is that the Arab League will put value on the table because we are now behaving in a zero-sum game that cannot be solved. If you put value on the table to make sure that the Palestinians will get help, that there will be recognition in Israel from countries that we don't see any chance today that they will recognize Israel. Who are exactly the Libyans or the Syrians or the Iraqis that will rec recognize Israel. The Arab peace initiative should be updated to the uh, current situation in the Middle East. And then I'm sure the Israeli government will embarrass it. So plan B. Plan B is a different paradigm. If the, the paradigm is saying since a full and comprehensive peace cannot be reached, let's do it a step by step. Let's do a transitional arrangement that if we cannot have a two-state solution, a grid solution, we will have a two-state reality that in the future, when time is right, maybe we can reach an agreement. Yes, it smells unilateral. And unilateralism in Israel has no good reputation. Thank and not, God, finally. Because the disengagement from Gaza is considered in the Israeli public as a failure. But when I look at it today, strategically it was the right move. It was the right move. Israel is not occupying Gaza anymore. 1.5 million Palestinians have their own independence. Uh, we can make it another move in the West Bank, which give Palestinians more land, more freedom of movement, and more uh, and less Israelis around. Uh, we can do this step coordinated with the Palestinians. We can do this step coordinated with the international community, and we are not closing the door to any initiative to reach a comprehensive peace in the future. So if Secretary Kerry will not be able to bring back Abbas, who is now uh, going with Hamas, who are not recognizing Israel, not recognizing the agreement between Israel and the PLO in the past, and not even denouncing terrorism. So I don't know if Kerry will be able to resume the peace process, but if not, there is another way. There is another way, and you are all invited to read it on my 
website, the INSS website. And let's move to the real problems in the Middle East. So May I just your, make your one Highness, comment? Please. Because it's very important here to, to recognize the reality that the general wants to, to not impose, but to, uh, to accept in, as, as and um, doesn't call it unilateral, that's good, but basically it is one-sided. Um, and I don't see the difference between the two. He wants to leave troops on West Bank territory, on the border on the Jordanian River with Jordan. That's his plan that I read it in the paper. He wants us, the Arabs, to recognize pre-negotiation that Israel's condition as a Jewish state be accepted, a condition that was never put when Israel signed agreements with Egypt and with Jordan. He wants us to accept that the, um, Israel, the, the, the Palestinian so-called entity that will come out uh, of this will allow for Israeli settlements in the West Bank. More land to be taken by these settlers who have absolutely nobody with the courage to tell them stop, particularly in, in Israel. That's the reality that the general is proposing. We as Arabs, and more particularly the Palestinians, should accept. It's not going to happen. And if we want to consider a reality, this is the reality I think that all of us should accept, that the Arab world as I said, is waging peace and not war. Second, that there is a proposal on the table. Tell us. We accept this proposal, but we want to change it. And sit down with us and talk about what those changes are. Don't simply say it's not good enough or that it is outdated. Nothing has come from Israel on the other side that can be called present or more current than the Arab Peace Initiative. Where is the Israeli plan? And I don't talk about the general's plan. I respect his position in, in Israel and so on. But where is Mr. Netanyahu on this? Where is Mr. Lieberman on this? These are the people who are deciding what the Israeli people will face from now on. So this is the reality, I think, that the Israeli public, under the guidance of their leadership, and as his general said, if Mr. Netanyahu agrees to the Arab Peace Initiative, 65% of the Israeli people will accept it. That is the reality. On the other side, equally, the public opinion among the Palestinians, particularly in the West Bank, still all the, the surveys that I've seen show that more than 60% of the Palestinians would also accept a two-state solution. So this is, I think, where we have to start from, rather than from the point of view of accepting, if you like, defeat in the, in the proposals of, of Mr. Kerry. And to blame, to blame Mahmoud Abbas for, for, for stopping the, 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 uh, the negotiations and not accepting and so on, I think that is totally unfair. Ask Mr. Indik. He's the one who pointed to the settlers as being the cause of the stoppage of the, of the negotiations. And this is supposed to be a fair-minded American official who is overseeing the negotiations. So don't blame Mr. Abbas. Please. He's, he was opposing Yasser Arafat when Yasser Arafat was alive during, if you remember, the Second Intifada by saying publicly we should not go the military way and try to force Israel to negotiate with us. This was in public, he said that, while Arafat was still alive. So to blame him now for running away from answering questions, or I think, is, is disingenuous. We have to be very clear about this. There is a proposition on the table. Sit down and talk about it. Talk about altering it, changing it. But to whom do you talk? 
Talk to the people whose land you occupy. Talk to the people whose land you steal. This is what is happening. Not to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia will fully support whatever agreement the Palestinians reach with, with the Israelis. And this is the right position for Saudi Arabia to do. So, General Yadlin, um, with your permission, we've had a, a rich exchange about the Arab Peace Initiative and negotiating issues. I'd like to turn to the question of Iran and then Syria. Um, and I'd like to begin by asking you about the negotiations with Iran. Um, since the uh, breakthrough uh, interim agreement that was reached in <coughs> Geneva last November, uh, the so-called P5 plus one has been negotiating uh, intently with Iran. There have been ups in that negotiation, but there have been some downs too. The deadline for negotiations in this window expires July 20. And so I want to ask you, as somebody who studied very carefully the question of what kind of deal uh, is possible and should be acceptable, to give us your assessment of where things stand um, as we head towards this July 20 deadline. As it stands now, the, the two sides are very, very far away. Very far away. Uh, the Iranians came to Geneva at the end of 2013 uh, because of the sanctions. For the first time, they came to negotiate not to buy time and to advance their nuclear program, but to lift the sanctions. However, the goal of the Iranians is to lift the sanctions with a minimum a rollback of their nuclear program. And this is uh, dictating their position in the negotiation. They don't, uh, until this moment, agree to any rolling back of the program. On the contrary, they ask for having more centrifuges and more sites and more nuclear reactors uh, in return to the sanction uh, relief. The Iranians are very good negotiators. And this is uh, an opening uh, position. It will be very interesting to see uh, what will happen in the night of the 19th mm -hmm. of July, because this is the time, the first time that they will move. In the language of the interim agreement, there is extension of another six months. Uh, if I have to uh, do predictions, I think, uh, there is another six months of negotiation coming. So your question will be relevant in the beginning of 2015. Uh, this is unless the sanctions are so painful to the Iranians that they really want to achieve uh, their lifting and they will be able to compromise. This is a possibility that my institute is now researching uh, uh, deeply to see how much the sanctions are still effective because voices in my government uh, told everybody that the relief from suction of the seven billion that were given to the Iranian already uh, will melt and will collapse the sanction regime. And in economy, sometimes the numbers are not important. It's the expectation and the psychology. Some people got a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, what we are seeing now is that the sanctions, very much like President Obama and, and Secretary Kerry predicted, are still holding. So there is hope that the, the Iranians will uh, be willing to reach what I will call an acceptable deal. Uh, I do afraid that the two sides will sign a bad deal. A bad deal, because my assumption is that sooner or later the Iranians will violate the deal or we will withdraw from the deal. And then they are very, very close to the bone. It's a matter of months. So if any deal that will keep the Iranians so close to the bone uh, is very problematic. A deal that will 
roll them back, uh, not months from the bomb, but years from the bomb, will give a guarantee that even if they break the deal, we'll have enough time to react, enough time to detect, enough time to take decisions and actions. Prince Turkey, would you give a similarly 